Try this for a deep, dark secret. The great detective show Remington Steele? We don't know if it's feminist. Follow. Detective Laura Holt always loved excitement, so she studied and apprenticed and put her name on an office. But absolutely nobody knocked down her door. A female private investigator in 1982 seems so feminine. So she invents a superior, a decidedly masculine superior. Suddenly there are cases around the block. It was working like a charm. Plenty of stories for her own TV show. Until the day he walked in, with his blue eyes and mysterious past. And before she knew it, he assumes Remington Steele's identity. Now she does the work, and he takes the bows. And often many of the storylines that should be hers become his. It becomes a more traditional show, but as long as people watch, she can play some gender role reversal and give women one of the most powerful female icons of the television 80s. I'm Susan Lambert Haddam. Welcome to 80s TV Ladies. And I'm Sharon Johnson. We are kicking off a new female driven TV show exploration, a show that it premiered in 1982. Today, we are diving into one of the most beloved mystery and detective shows of all time. Remington Steel. I can't wait. Neither can I. First, we'll be talking about the pilot and a general overview of the show. And we've got some deep, dark secrets, according to Susan. Well, deep, dark secrets sounded better than some really interesting tidbits you may not know about Remington Steel. We're going to give you our first impressions, tell you about the stars and guest stars on the show, and let you know about a few really cool special guests that will be coming up on this podcast in later episodes. This podcast? This podcast. Our very own podcast is going to have special episodes? I know, right? Oh my God, you guys are going to lose your minds. Okay. (laughs) All right. So let's take ourselves back to October 1982. When we were youngsters, Epcot had just opened at Disney World. Cats opened on Broadway. The Chicago Tylenol murders had happened. And President Ronald Reagan had declared a war on drugs. It was the year of the Falkland War. Top TV shows were 60 Minutes, Dallas, MASH, Magnum P.I., Dynasty, which I didn't watch because I'm a Dallas fan. You had to be. It was Dallas or Dynasty. It really was. It was like football. Exactly. Three's Company, Simon and Simon, The Love Boat, The A-Team were all big shows back then. All right. I uh, was a big fan of The A-Team at the time and Simon and Simon, definitely Magnum P.I., wanted a Ferrari. Um, did a little bit of Three's Company, though I wasn't technically allowed to watch it, according to my mother. But then came this new show, Remington Steel. What do you do? You remember it from then, Sharon? And what 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 did you watch? Did you watch it? And what do you think? I do remember it from them. I remember it being one of my favorite shows. I have to say, I don't have any real specific memories of watching it at that time. Um, other than just knowing how much I loved it and how much I look forward to it and just how darn cute Laura Holt and Remington Steele were together. They were adorable. I also remember it. I also watched it. Um, I loved that style. I love the action comedy. And um, this was a, you know, sort of mystery action comedy. I love movies. So it sort of uh, satisfied that, and I loved those stars too. They were pretty amazing. They were yeah. they were pretty groundbreaking when they came out. You were like, "Who are these people? These are fabulous people. I want to know and be." It really ticked off a lot of boxes for me. Some of what some of what you've mentioned, the mystery aspect of it. I love mysteries. I love a good show. I love a whodunit. I always like to try to see if I can figure it out. Um, I love action. I love comedy. And somehow this show managed to find a way to blend all of those things into one show. It was almost like a miracle of television. I do also remember the score and the tone of the show because it was, even though it was pretty goofy sometimes, it had a really interesting, warm and serious tone and look of the piece. And then that friggin' amazing, the the music for the pilot in the second episode was by Henry Mancini. and, And he scored two themes for the show, the Remington theme and the Laura theme. And they're really just, startlingly great yeah it's 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 really one of the the best um uh tv theme songs of all time i think it's and it it fits the show so well in so many ways yeah and i think it was nice i i feel like it was it felt at least to me a little more sophisticated and interesting than heart to heart which somehow didn't feel i never really connected with heart to heart 
although I watched episodes of it. I don't think I ever watched Heart to Heart. Well, we're going to have to explore that show, even though it, I, I think it technically started in the 70s. It did run through the 80s. All of the shows we're currently looking at, Rem, um, Remington Steel, Scarecrow Mrs. King, and Moonlighting, we're kind of chasing that show. The success of that show it was very big, very successful. Um, but it felt more like, th- for me, it felt more like the adult show. It felt more like for my mom, whereas Remington Steel definitely felt more modern to me. Now it feels charming and antiquated a little bit, but holds up really well. So let's talk about how we feel about it now that we've revisited it. I really, I think it holds up maybe a little bit better than you do, mainly because it is a, it is an episodic show. Yes, we have the, um, the thread of the, the will they or won't they, but even that I think they've hand, they handled in this show much better than it's been handled in most shows that have tried to extend that out over a long period of time. So I give the writers a lot of credit for that. And I think that in some ways, the idea that a woman would have to invent a male boss because people weren't taking her seriously and doing this work that she was so good at. Sadly, there's still some some things in, in our world as it exists today where that would also be the case. So that aspect of the show, I think, still holds up and sadly is still kind of a thing in, in many industries. So I was surprised, frankly, at, at how well I thought it held up for me. Um, in doing a re as I'm doing the rewatch of the show, and and again, don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed. You know, I'm really enjoying going through this uh, the entire uh, the entire five seasons, and in some ways, again, I do think certain episodes hold up better than certain episodes of Scarecrow Mrs. King. Certainly, in terms of a little bit more sophistication in the discussions of the relationship and of the power dynamics in that relationship. I'm surprised. I was, there were a couple episodes I was really surprised where she was, they're articulating what is going on for them in a way that even though then other times they're sort of, it's hard to track the relationship because like, well, why don't, it seems like they still like each other. Why are they being mad at each other Um, (laughs) for the, you know, for, for the purpose of this episode. Um, at the same time, I do think they were both pretty clear on what they wanted. Mm-hmm. And so it sort of m- makes you buy it and, and, and pretty clear on their fears from that relationship of why they're, you know, both of them are having trouble sort of committing to it, but for different reasons. That was one of the things that really surprised me in, in doing the rewatch because I couldn't think of another show since that handled that as well as this show did, as frankly as this show did almost 40 years ago. It really surprised. And and I think for me, maybe that's one of the things that permeates over the show. This idea that these are two grown up people. They've, you know, very maturely discussed their relationship and the fact that they're both very attracted to each other, but for various reasons, mostly because Laura is a little more than a little concerned about what she doesn't know about him and what he's keeping from her and expresses her reservations about that. And I couldn't think of another show that handled a possible romantic relationship so maturely, so calmly, so straightforwardly. And it it, it really amazed me. Well, certainly at the time. And again, yeah. it, it, Cheers uh, was around this time, too, also dealing with sort of male-female dynamics and a will-they-won't-they. They. But you were definitely watching two people who couldn't really talk about why they would or wouldn't. We we just knew it as an audience. It was just in the ethos somehow of, of those other relationships. So, yeah, I do think, and what I was saying is it, I think it, this, sh- this show very clearly and, and And directly references the Thin Man and 30s romantic comedies, as well as Heart to Heart. It sort of comments on on Heart to Heart. I think it's uh, one of its precursors is the Avengers. That sort of it's sexy and fun to 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 be detectives and uh, chase things down. The shows that it inspired, obviously, are Moonlighting, which came directly from it. Literally, Glenn Gordon Karen, the super, who was the supervising producer for the first half of the first season, went on to create Moonlighting, the sexier, banterier, crazier version of of that. Um, and Castle, I think, has a real nod to this show. Kind of almost any male female mm-hmm. partner exploration. At the very least, they they like 
probably watched at least one or two episodes of Remington before they made their show. Um, the reviews are pretty positive when it came out. Uh, one, one in particular uh, was like a modern man, a modern woman, and a marvelous entertainment, which I think for some reason really made me laugh. But let's let's sort of what's interesting is sort of there was a saga cell on this, right? It was she wants to be a detective. She wants to you know have her own business. And she opens up that business and basically can't get hired. So she makes up a fake Remington Steel. She makes up a guy, her boss, and then starts getting jobs. And then a guy steps in and starts playing that role. And he shows up in the middle of a case and they decide to start working together. Very funny concept for a show, right? Very, very funny concept for a show. And yet, you know, we're going to find out uh, in the research I've done that, that it didn't really, it took a long time to sell that show. A surprisingly long time. Yeah. So the thing that is timeless about this show that makes it successful then and I think makes it hold up now are the stars of the show. Stephanie Zimbalist and Pierce Brosnan are spectacularly well cast. They are fantastic together. They are fun to watch. And they have that same kind of special tone that fits the show where they are both sophisticated and funny and confident. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's the power of the performance. It's the chemistry between all of the actors on the show that really make it all sing. I mean, it's the the last piece of the puzzle of all the things that come together to make this or any show successful or anything good. But without those two those two performers, those two performances, there is no Remington Steel. And it's so interesting. I mean, Michael Gleason, co-creator of the show, uh, talks about that. One of the comments he made about Pierce in the pilot and in this in the early episodes was he's so skilled at having a good time with his character. And I thought that was such a great way to talk about an actor really embracing what they're doing. And that's the confidence of it is having a good time with the character that you're playing and their ease of um, being comfortable together. Like again, off the bat seems pretty spectacular. And again, I think is the is, you know, one of the things we love about television is how quickly you can create those relationships. And when they work, you're like, in, the honest is in. All right. See you in five seasons. Plus, this is a show that touched on sometimes um, one genre a little bit more hard, harder than the other in an episode or across episodes. But the performers had to be able to do comedy. They had to be able to do drama. They had to do action. They did so much running in this show. It was astonishing. Um, And to be able to do all of it well, and again, all of it in in every episode. And that's so remarkable. It's so remarkable what they they were able to bring to this show. And that's what holds up. Mm -hmm. The other, the, um, in talking about Stephanie Zibelis, they were saying that she really got the show, right? She, she very early on was like, oh, this, this is a show that has, three feet is three feet off the ground. So the only way to play it is with both feet on the ground. And so they both take it very seriously, even though there's so much humor in the, in the piece Um, and gets to be more like, I think they loosen up a little bit in later episodes than from the, the early episodes, as of course you would do once you kind of find the direction of the show and, and people really engaged with the humor of the show for sure. And I'm sure the, the writers put, began to put more and more things in, to the writing as they saw they had performers that could handle it. That I'm sure made a big difference too. So I give them all credit. For sure. And we're going to also do a little bit of dive into some of our favorite episodes real quick from, from or like an early thing. We'll, we'll dive into more later, but I want to kind of just off the top kind of talk about like your favorite episodes, um, my favorite episodes so far. Well, I think you have to start with the pilot. They got it so right as we've just been discussing on so many levels and without a pilot that good to set up everything that comes after it sometimes it's hard to come back from that but the pilot for this show i mean you could have practically you know except for the element of remington steel uh, embodied by this mystery man this episode could fit just about anywhere in the series it's really well written. It's really a tight mystery. It's got all kinds of good, fun stuff going on. And it's really terrific. Yeah, it starts off with a, both a good case and this like fabulous introduction for both her as a character. And then this this complete turn 
that is now going to change her life and her detective agency and the course of what comes next. So it's a, it's one of those really pieces that does work well. The 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 so it starts off and she's got a case and the case is to protect be the security for these very special diamonds that are from South Africa and travel the world being special diamonds and a a car creator a special car manufacturer is, re- is revealing his first amazing car and needs the diamonds as being the unique, you know, sort of press to go with his unique car. And so they're having to protect the diamonds. And it turns out that Pierce Brosnan's character is after the diamonds because he is a con man and a thief. And so when he shows up to try to get the diamonds, he's all, he basically shows up in the guise of an inspector from South Africa who is tracking down the diamonds and trying to protect them and then takes on. So he first comes in and introduces himself as Ben Pearson, an inspector from South Africa. (laughs) And and they're clearly attracted to each other at that point. And then later he pretends to be Remington Steele in order to get out of a sticky situation. And then uh, later she finds out that he's pretending to be Remington Steele and it turns out nobody could be Remington Steele because Remington Steele doesn't exist and she's been using him as this facade. So it is sort of liars talking to liars in some ways and they're both sort of conning each other, which I think gives equal weight to both of them. And so it's a very it's sort of very exciting to watch all those sort of revelations play out. But like you said, the case itself is very interesting um, and 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 apparently based on DeLorean. I hadn't thought of that, but that makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah that's what they said. They 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 wrote it. They based it on De- DeLorean, who made the DeLorean and was very famously sort of this renegade in the car world. Um, and then they said about a year later he was arrested for all of his you know backdoor dealing. So they probably couldn't have written that pilot a year later, <laughs> which is very interesting. But the pilot is, it really is, if you're looking for kind of really great, solid pilots, it's pretty much one of them. It has got a lot of pieces that do work for it. It's got a very interesting cast. It's beautifully directed, I think, for the time. So the co-creator of this show, this is the interesting thing. So we haven't even talked about how this show. Right. This, this show is created by Robert Butler and Michael Gleason. It was originally conceived of by Robert Butler. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in my in my Deep Dark Secrets. Ooh. But ultimately... He's Robert Butler was a huge director. He directed the pilots of many brilliant TV shows, including Star Trek and Remington Steele, and later went on to direct the pilot of Moonlighting. So, <laughs> he, but he was the co-creator of the show and paired with Michael Gleason, also another very accomplished television creator, writer, and producer. And again, together, they seem to really create quite a spectacular and unique for the time show. My other favorite, um, some of my other favorite episodes was they they get they bring in um, Stephanie Zimbalist's dad, Efren Zimbalist Jr., who was a star in like a huge star mm-hmm. as well. She, and so she becomes a recurring character, Daniel Chalmers, who's this con man who was sort of also the mentor for Pierce Brosnan's character, who, by the way, has no name. He does not know his real name. He presents with five passports with five different names, all after Humphrey Bogart characters. So this guy is a real mystery when he shows up and a real con man and very slick um, and very charming. And so there's lots of reasons for her not to trust him. Right, right. Um, But he helps her out in a pinch. And so she's like, "Okay, we'll come be this guy. (laughs) You do buy that conceit a little bit. It has to be a TV show. So I guess we have to do that. Well, you do. I mean, you you do buy that because in in some ways he didn't give her much choice. But at the same time, I think she also saw where if she could control him, it could be to her advantage. She could control what he did and where, you know, how he how he presented himself. It would be to her advantage. For sure, because she wants her detective agency to be successful. And so I think she's chasing the success of being the top detective agency Mm -hmm. and has kind of run the invisible guy as far as she can run. And so having an actual person is going to mean that I think to her that she'll get more jobs and bigger jobs and more high profile jobs. And that's clearly what she's also chasing. She's ambitious 
and he fits that ambition mm -hmm. at the right time. And so that's why she says yes. So she, they do make sense of it. And so I think it does sort of, they both need each other a little bit. It's a little unclear why he doesn't just move on, but it has to do with her. He oh, yeah. is entranced by her. And he's entranced by the opportunity to, I think, step into the role of a better person. Yeah, I mean, I think what I've always taken away from the show is he was never what could be considered a, for lack of a better word, a bad guy, a villain. He was a he was someone who had been doing things to get by and found he had a good facility for going around the world and doing these sorts of things. And and he lands in this situation where he gets to pretend to be use all of his skills in this role of this super detective and begins to find that it really kind of suits him. It's, it's kind the of ultimate con. It. It's yeah. the ultimate con. Like it's it's a it's a con that he can slip into very easily because he has all those skills. Um but also I think he just likes it. He's clearly even though he's this like big thief and con man and uh can throw a punch he also seems to sort of have the heart of the artist. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the love of sort of this 1930s comedy, they're re they really are. They are making direct references in the pilot to The Thin Man and The Thin Man movies. And that's a husband and wife team that are basically detectives and, and chasing down crime, but also like wearing their tuxedos and drinking a lot and being quippy and funny. Again, very heart to heartish. This is more down to earth. They're a little scrappier, mm -hmm. but the comedy and the nod to the thirties is so clear in this pilot and so fun again for movie lovers in the first two episodes, they make four actual literal references to movies and that continues through the series it's one of the really fun things about the production that also was fairly unique for the time is to recognize like so here's some notable production issues that i noticed they use obviously the word steel s-t-e-e-l-e -E -E, in the episode title names for every episode mm -hmm. that was you that wasn't particularly definitely new, unique at the time, but it was somewhat special. Mm -hmm. And I remember that again from childhood, older childhood, that, and they make movie references in almost every episode. So as I said, the very first movie reference in this show is to Casablanca. And so that tells you what kind of show it's, is nodding to, right? Yeah. Then Thin Man, there's a direct reference uh, North by North to North by Northwest and to Tea and Sympathy. That's just in the first two episodes where they're literally quoting lines, showing like images on television from the thin man or literally setting up a scene that is the exact same scene and commenting on it. He says, oh, I'm going to set up this dinner party and then I'll accuse the bad guy of it <laughs> in the middle of the dinner party to catch him, uh, which is a direct reference to the thin man. Um, and he's he's quoting characters. So he's a character who is sort of in love with movies and using those as a way to be a detective. Yeah, because I, I would imagine on some level, that grow, obviously he grew up watching all those movies, being a fan of all those movies and thinking, wow, isn't that great? Um, what a great way to live. I'd like to be, you know, uh, one of the characters in these movies. And that's kind of what Remington Steele became for him. Um, and, and, and as a, as a um, classic movie fan, I always loved that. It made me so happy when they would mention, you know, whatever movie um, that was uh, woven into the plot for that week's episode. I just thought that was so great. I don't know off the top of my head if any other show has been able to do that as successfully as they have or, or done it as overtly as they obviously did on this show. And I just loved it. It was another aspect of the show that I thought really elevated it. And it was one that is definitely um, from Michael Gleason. He talks about it. And it was because he was a big film nerd. Um, he, basically, it sounded like the studio didn't love it um, or the network didn't love it, but but the fans did. And, mm -hmm. if he, and if they didn't do a reference in an episode, they heard from fans about it. Oh, I'm sure. 
Um, and it is one of the things that I think a lot of fans love. And it and it's one of those things that makes you want to watch those movies. Um, I, you know, they mentioned Tea and Sympathy. I've never seen it. And I was like, oh, I, I want to go watch that now. Um, I've seen the others, but uh, that are referenced there, but they're throughout the series. And so you feel like, oh, I want I have some homework to do after watching this because I want to go find that reference. But I also think it was an interesting thing. It was starting to be the consciousness of people recognizing that they were in real life using movies and television to learn to sort of decide how to behave. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. uh, there was a, a, a um, cousin-in-law of mine who uh, was a Vietnam vet. And I was talking to him. Um, he was a sniper, very a very successful sniper. And I was talking to him about what he would, you know, he went he at eighteen to Vietnam, and I was like, "How did you do that?" And you know, was jumping out of planes and being this like sniper where he was killing people. And he's like, "I would just imagine myself in a movie." Wow. And I thought that was a real, like, I'm like, oh, I think that everybody kind of does that. That's how you get through things. You're like, well, here's how I'm going to do something that I don't know how to do. It was just, it, stay, it stayed with me. And, and so there's something weirdly <laughs> serious about that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it, 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 you know, it's one, of those re- it's one of those reasons I think we do love all these stories and movies and television are so profound in our pop culture is it's 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 how are we going to behave how are we going to mm-hmm. be and so it it was vital at the time um to i don't know it, it, I've, I've gotten off on a whole other tangent <laughs> that, okay. that what we were going to talk about very serious <laughs> oh susan oh my god the santa annas are coming um anyway but let back to the show i love the movie references the fans love the movie references clearly it gave a lot of color and flavor to that character that made that was extra charming. Mm-hmm. And then she starts doing it. It's one of the things yes. that she learns from him is, wait, this movie, she, she's willing to take something from him. And that's that's his way to approach the detective agency. And then she's like, well, here's how we do it in real life. And so I do love that he's fairly incompetent at being a detective. And uh, and she's obviously very good at it. So it's a little bit of the reverse of Scarecrow as King. Um, I will say that both Pierce Brosnan and Stephanie Zimbalis as actors did do a lot of their own stunts. And it is a very pretty, pretty stunning show, more less car chases and more fist fights and mm-hmm. racing after ch- chasing people down. Um, and um, and in particular, Stephanie Zimbalis is pretty amazing. One of the best runners in high heels that I've seen. You're like, wait, she's really doing that. You, like there are times you can really see her running in the high heels and they make a reference to it. I think in one of your favorite episodes and mine, but really yours. Well, and and I don't know that I've ever seen an actress in a TV show or a movie for that matter that did so many, not just so much running, but climbing over walls and jumping off of things and into things and over things. And uh, it's really amazing. Hanging on to cars. You're like, again, I'm a little worried about the actors from the eighties. I, I don't <laughs> think they should have been doing all of this. I don't think they could do them now. I think insurance companies would be like, no, you're not taking the star of the show and having them be dragged by a car. It's, it's pretty insane. They're, they are doing a lot of their own stunts. Apparently in, in, uh, Pierce Brosnan contracted Bell's palsy after an episode in which he was sort of did a fist fight in the LA river and, and the LA river notoriously, which is basically a big cement trough for those that don't know the LA river, yeah. um, with a little bit of water running in it, very shallow water, but also usually pretty toxic water. Uh, yeah. So they had to kind of stop production because their lead actor got <laughs> ill because of a stunt that he did. Uh, see, and you think that, you know, being an actor is pretty simple, pretty easy. No, no, not on this show. You're running, you're jumping, you're, you know, getting injured and all kinds of stuff on this show. You just never know. I blame James Gardner. He famously did a lot of his stunts from, for, <laughs> for, for Rock for Files and, and, and later talked about how much he paid for it with his back and, and other 
problems. And I think they were young and they were both clearly very capable. Stephanie Zimbalis um, just uh, really had, you know, is this like crazy quadruple threat, like actress, dancer, singer, writer, and just is clearly capable of doing it all, both as an actress, but also then that character, it, it sort of transforms to that character where she's like, I can do everything I want to do it. Um, and, and obviously that was just really impactful. That was, there were a lot of male characters like that. Mm-hmm. There were not a lot of female characters like yeah. that on television, even with heart to heart. It's them as a, as a team, mm-hmm. right? It's her as a wife doing it. Even Scarecrow Mrs. King, it's, it's her. She's not going, I'm going to go be a spy on my own. This is a woman that is, I am a detective and I'm going to be it on my own if that's what I have to do to get the jobs I want and the credit I want. Yeah. And she'd built this agency. She, I think, probably had taken it as far as she could have without um, a presence of, of Remington Steel, because I would imagine more and more of her clients, as in the pilot episode, were like, what do you mean I can't meet him? Where is he? What's he doing? They, they use the excuse like, well, Mr. Steel likes to act in the consulting capacity in most of these cases. And you're like, <laughs> why isn't he supposed to be? But she's pulled it off. They've right. pulled it off. And she has two sidekicks that have been helping her pull it off. Um, uh, her secretary, um, and I'm blanking on the name, but we're going to look it up right now while I'm talking. And um, and then her detective assistant, plays by James Beard, and he's like the other inspector, that they sort of came up together. We learn in later episodes that that they were sort of trained together and worked at the same agencies together. And then she went off and started this agency and he works for her, mm-hmm. which again is, is a throwback to the Honey West, uh, a, a, a TV show where she was a detective and had a male assistant. And he clearly is second to her. Um, and so they're, they're in on it. And I think that is, so they only last one season though. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons is because they're in on the charade as Remington Steele would say in the first season. Well, you know, I never like to see, you know, actors lose a gig because they're hard to come by. But the producers brilliantly cast Doris Roberts as Mildred Krebs comes season two. And she just brought so much to that role and to the show in a way that the other two actors maybe just weren't allowed to or maybe their actor, their characters didn't allow for. It was brilliant. The three of them together were just such a great team. Well, we're going to get into season. Yeah. I mean, you're jumping ahead to season I two. I, I can't help like, myself. <laughs> you know, uh, I just want to stay on James Reed for a minute. He played Michael Murphy. Murphy uh, Michael? Murphy Michaels. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Murphy Michaels. Not Michael Murphy. Yeah. Eh, Two first you know. names. What anyway, are you going to do? James Reed, very um, strong actor at the time, very, uh, you know, in a, in a lot of stuff, and basically could have like run his own show at the time mm-hmm. or could have been on his own show. But but by the end of the first season, it's clear that it's become the, you know, Remington and Laura show right. and the Pierce and Stephanie show. And so he actually goes to the showrunners at the end of season one and is like, I don't have anything to do. You really need to let me go. And so that makes them rethink. So they decide to let go of both um, Bernice and Murphy and replace those two characters with one character. Um, And that like sort of combine them into one secretary slash second investigator. And we're going to talk about that in Deep Dark Secrets. Excellent. All right. We're going to take a little break. Sounds like a plan. And we're back. Why don't we just dive into it? Let's do Deep Dark Secrets right now. <laughs> Nobody's stopping us. We can do it. Yeah. And, and so continuing on with that, they originally were planning to bring in an actress to be the receptionist, secretary, assistant, whatever you want to call it, that might potentially be a rival for Remington's affections. And Doris Roberts came in and auditioned and they went, we think we're going to go another way with this. Because yeah, it completely she's just changed. too good. It completely yeah. changed the direction of that character and I think the show mm-hmm. and made it stronger. I completely agree with you. Yeah. And I'm also very excited to say it made it more female driven. Yeah. First season of the show, there are two leads and two sort of 
you know, second to leads. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's 50-50, which again, pretty good for a TV show in the 80s, 50-50 male-female ratio. But when we get to season two, it's Stephanie, Pierce Brosnan, and Doris Roberts. So it makes it 60% female lead cast, (laughs) 66%. And I'm pretty excited about that because that does not happen very often. And I think it it does really change the show in a great way because now you have two female characters who have something to do, who are working together, who, again, I'm not sure that it ever really passes the Bechdel test much at all. The very basic, you know, two women having a conversation that's not about a man because most of the time when it's the two women having a conversation, it's mostly about Remington Steele. Sometimes it's about the case, though, whether it be... um Mildred giving um, Laura information that she's gleaned or or Laura giving uh, Doris an assignment to go take care of something or do something to All solve right, the case. I stand corrected. You're no, right. It's okay. no, no. But having said that, on the other side of that, though, you do have uh, Mildred coming in and thinking, of course, that Remington Steele is Remington Steele deferring to him, despite the fact that Laura keeps saying to, ha- to her, um, you, you need to talk to me about that or I can handle that or you don't need to remember I'm, you know, um, because Mildred doesn't know. Mildred thinks he secret. is Remington yeah. Steele and that Remington Steele is the head of the agency. Exactly. He, she does not know in that in in season two that, in fact, it is Laura that is the boss. Mm-hmm. They keep sort of saying, oh, you should include her. And then ultimately in further seasons, she does become to know that secret and and becomes part of the full team. And I think giving that evolution to a character mm-hmm. is is a great way to go. It, and I also think that there's something really wonderful about Doris Roberts. They give her a little bit of um a little bit of romantic moments. Mm-hmm. They give her um a lot to do. She's very funny. Oh, oh my yeah. god. She's really funny and also warm and also kind of holds her own with them. I think in later seasons they start to not use her as much as they should and and it becomes challenging because it's not as much fun it's it's really wonderful when the three of them are going and the introduction yeah. of her character at the beginning of season two is really great it is it is both um really great and and clearly it's a it's a two-parter and it's clearly and, and they go on location in in mexico and it is clearly also a, a, a little bit of an audition for James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I love about one of the, it's a small thing, but Mildred kind of has her own, I don't want to call it a theme song, but a musical cue that basically denotes the Mildred of it all. Yes. And every now and then after the first couple episodes, when she's introduced, we get to hear it occasionally when she's about to go back into that mode as part of a case or something. And I just love that so much. Yes. I love that she gets her own theme song. I don't think it's written by Henry Mancini, no. but the music <laughs> continues to be good. He does not continue to do all the music for the show, right. but it, the music continues to be pretty strong. Um, and they do have those lovely moments of, of characters. Um, you know, Doris Roberts, of course, was was again a, a well known actress at the time. This basically made her into a star, even bigger than she was. She went on to win three Emmys for playing the mother long Marie Barone on Everybody Loves Raymond, and continued to be a big star. And she was nominated once for Remington Steele as well. I believe hers is the only Emmy nomination, sadly for the show. That's crazy. That I seems know. crazy to There's me. There's so many things wrong with that as far as I'm concerned. Like, I think the cinematography, that pilot is beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. It's very dark, like, which is, like, in tone, it's, like, it's got a, a very um, kind of low-key palette. Um, it, it's it got a very noir. There's a lot of nods to noir as well. Um, all right. But so that's our, yes. that's our first deep, dark secret, is that they were not looking for Doris Roberts for the character in right. season two, for Mildred Kebbs. Mm-hmm. Deep top secret number two, and we talked, we almost, we almost gave this one away. It was first conceived, this, this idea was first conceived in 1969 by the TV director, Robert Butler. He pitched it at the time to Grant Tinker, who was not like super run, running NBC Grant Tinker, but was the beginning of, and even pre Mary Tyler Moore, Grant Tinker, Mm. or MTM Productions, Grant Tinker. And he was like, 
I think I, I, I don't I think it's too early. Grant Tinker was the one that said, yeah, it's too soon for this. Yeah. That's again, I'm reading through a yep. lot of old articles and, and that's my that's story. And that's my story. <laughs> I'm going to stick to it for now until we hear otherwise. Um, number two, it was originally pitched without the actual Remington Steele showing up. It was pitched as a female private eye who makes up a man so she can do her job. It was only when they went back to pitch it to Grant Tinker again. <laughs> Uh, years and then later. to NBC years yeah. later in, in the late seventies, uh, early eighties, mm-hmm. um, that basically, uh, they said, well, go work with Michael Gleason, um, on developing it a little bit more and figuring out what it really is. And Michael Gleason came up that with the idea that wouldn't it be great if she, if, if he showed up the, the, you know, fake man and made her crazy Mm -hmm. they came up with that they're like oh this is it this is amazing because again you know you got a lot of twists and turns in that you're like oh that sounds like a tv show nbc are passed (laughs) so they went and pitched it nbc passed um they're like oops okay but then very shortly grant tinker um became head of nbc and then he's like yeah no i think we're gonna say yes now (laughs) it helps to be the boss Uh, Deep Dark Secret number three, the original pilot that was ordered by NBC actually ended up being episode two of the series. Um, NBC wanted to make sure that what they had was more than just a concept. They wanted um, the creators to imagine a pilot where the characters were already working together six months in so that they could like go, oh, yeah, this can be a case by case. But then once they picked up the show, they realized it was a little bit confusing and they wanted a premise pilot to show how they met because they knew that people, um, audiences, I think their test audiences were like, I don't know what's happening. Smart. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I think this is the kind of show that dropping the audience in the middle of it would, as you said, been too confusing and people would not have been quite sure what the heck they were watching. So... And I think they were trying to make sure like that it did work as a mm-hmm. as a case by case show, which was what they wanted, right? They just wanted case by case. They wanted people to tune in every work. And that's what was working. That was Simon and Simon. That was Magnum PI. Right. Um, yeah. that was heart to heart. It's like you didn't have to really know that those characters were gonna evolve. Magnum PI didn't evolve as a character. Simon and Simon didn't evolve as characters in their relationship to each other. They had drama and they had stories and and things that happened to them but their relationship didn't change and their relationship to themselves didn't change um same with you know angela lansbury like murder she wrote she's always she's always whoever that character that angela lansbury <laughs> played that basically feels like angela lansbury <laughs> and um, so i think again television was a little bit worried about the we're going to have people change over the course of a show and, you know, and basically what television is now, which is, you know, ever evolving. And if you miss an episode, you, a character may not be there when you get back. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so yes. Yeah, so uh, the original pilot became episode two. They um, made a new pilot. They kind of tweaked some of episode two to make it work so that it, um, was there my other deep dark secret is that stephanie zimbalis was the star of the show it wasn't pierce brosnan she was number one on the call sheet she's first credited she turned it down twice apparently because stephanie zimbalis was a star she was a television star Mm -hmm. she was a tv movie star she came from an entertainment dynasty her grandfather was Ephraim zimbalis senior a renowned violinist married to a renowned opera singer alma gluck and then, of course, Efren Zimbalist Jr., renowned star, big star. I knew Efren Zimbalist Jr. name. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it. I didn't know Efren Zim- Zimbalist Sr. as a kid. So I knew I watched the show for her. I watched the show because it, I was like, oh, Stephanie Zimbalist. I think she had just been on. Well, I remember her from Centennial. She starred in the big TV miniseries Centennial. Which was some giant. That's all you, they did in the seventies was giant. They did a mini lot series, of giant mini series, yes. historical mini series. Most of them were really great, but that's another story for another pilot for another day, I suppose. And Pierce Brosnan had done also a mini series. That's what made him kind of a known actor entity. Um, it was called Mansions of Ireland. No, it's called Mansions of something. 
The Mannions of America? Mannions of America, thank you. I read it and I think mansions. But it's the Mannions. It was about an Irish fa- family immigrating to America, and he was basically the star of that. Despite the fact that I saw a lot of 70s and maybe early 80s miniseries, I don't think I ever saw that one. But something to add to my my to-do list. But, you know, it, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because if you look at the the cover art on the DVDs or whatever little um, shot you see on whatever streaming service perhaps you're watching this on, you would think that he was number one on the call sheet. Of course, the show is named after his character, so it's hard not to think about that. And he did go on and play James Bond, but it was not him. It was her. And she was always the first um, actor listed in the credits throughout the entire show as well, I believe. So there was a bit of a big kerfuffle when the DVD season one was first released in 2005 um, because only he was on the front of the DVD cover. Only his name was on the front of the DVD cover. And they had to later go back and put a sticker I had to add a sticker, also starring Stefan Zimelis, <laughs> which again is the show, right. right? Like it's the show. You've got to be kidding me. The, the second became the first <laughs> and the woman was forgotten. Yeah. So he takes all the bows for sure. Which so mirrors the show. It so mirrors <laughs> the mean, show. Life imitating art to a large extent. It's so crazy. She wasn't interviewed for the season one DVDs. They did go back and correct it because people were pretty outraged, as they should be 2005. Come on, people. I will say there are great, great interviews and great commentaries on the DVD, it, the DVDs. The DVD releases are pretty, pretty great, but it's really the interviews and the commentaries and the special features, which is one of the things I think we miss on the streaming. I do, too. Some... On some streamers, you can get commentary, but I I don't know how prevalent that is. I mean, it, since I've been watching the rewatching the shows on DVDs, I've been able to um, watch some of the extras and and commentary. But I don't know how I, I I don't know how prevalent that is when it comes to streaming on on most TV shows in particular. Maybe movies, it's different. I'm not sure. So it was so helpful. I mean. One of the things is you can find stuff now if you go looking for it. But it was so amazing in the time of DVDs and in when I was in grad school, film school, and and, and the laser discs, the Criterion collection mm. of movies, all the special features. You were able to have a little film school in those incredibly valuable information and and information that I'm afraid will go away. Yeah, right. If it's not in streaming, what is interesting is. You know, the show is now streaming on Amazon. I was kind of struck by the description of the show on Amazon. Shall I read it to you? Private investigator Laura Holt has a problem. No one appears interested in hiring a female private eye. Her solution? She invents a boss named Remington Steele, changes her agency name to Remington Steele Detective Agency, and suddenly she has more cases than she can handle. And that's it. They're selling her. They're selling a female-driven show. Fascinating. Which I thought was pretty fascinating. Wow. Because Amazon is all about algorithms and what will sell and make people watch based on what they're looking at. And I think right now, a female-driven show, they decided that was the best way to do. They may be thinking, well, people already know that Pierce Brosnan was also on that show. <laughs> <laughs> and there's certainly an image of the two of them on the show, but I thought it was very fascinating given that they're selling the show as basically a female-driven show. They're not even mentioning that this guy shows up and starts to be Remington Steele. That's really fascinating. That's fascinating. Huh. Okay, that wasn't even one of my deep, dark secrets. Yeah, but it's an important thing to know, I think, in that the search algorithms for streaming sites of any kind do use, you know, what if, if you're searching for female detective... Well, it sounds like it's going to show you Remington Steel. Yeah. As opposed to not showing you Remington Steel yeah. because that's not how they categorize it within Amazon. And it shows you the power of that, of yeah. that categorization. Oh, that's so interesting. And maybe what people are looking for now mm-hmm. as opposed to 1980. 
Um, one of my other little interesting tidbits, not really a secret, is um, the actual big rating success. I thought this was a success from the early on, and it was a successful show, but its, it, its big ratings came in season three. So uh, in season two, it was actually considered a success. They gave it a bigger budget going to season two, also a little bit unusual, and, um, and, and moved it from Friday night to Tuesday night after the A-Team, one of their most successful shows. Nice. They got more money, more eyeballs, and they were starting to climb in the ratings. Um, but season three was the biggest ratings uh, of the show. Um which of course meant that here's my other thing. This is a show that was canceled and then reverse canceled <laughs> after season four, they canceled the show. It was like a top 20 show and they canceled it because they just didn't have room in their schedules. NBC had become a, apparently a, a very successful in those interim years and um, suddenly apparently didn't have room in the schedule for this show. I don't know if that's the true story. Maybe we'll get that throughout the next podcast episodes. But then Pierce Brosnan was offered James Bond, or they was in the docks to, to do the next James Bond, to do Living Daylights. And I read also over that summer, the ratings went up. Because, because of reruns. Of, because of reruns and because of the news that, that the star of Remington Steel was now being considered to play James Bond. So people went, oh, I should go check out this show and watch the reruns over the summer. So NBC went, huh. And... So next thing you know, Remington Steel is coming back. NBC Warren, Warren Littlefields reversed the cancellation and decides to call them back for a final season. Season five turns out to be only six made for TV films. Apparently everybody was miserable. Pierce Brosnan did a famous People magazine cover story. Yes, I believe the, the title of the article on People magazine with him on the cover is Take this job and shove it. And he's looking unhappy. Uh -huh. It may be one of the only People magazine covers where you have a giant star frowning. <laughs> he's frowning. It's hard to imagine something like that making it on the cover of a magazine today. But it's, it's, it's really kind of astounding. Um, the subtitle or the subtext is, Trapped on Remington Steel, Pierce Brosnan sounds off on his battle to be the new James Bond. Wow. I mean, that's pretty huge. I, d I honestly don't remember that. I was in, in film school at the time, so there was a lot I was missing. But uh, 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 Stephanie Zimbalis also was unable to do a film that she had been cast in. She had been cast to play Officer Ann Lewis in RoboCop. And she had to turn it down to go back for season five. And in a later interview, she was like, well, I didn't complain. I wasn't bitter. Which does bring us a little bit to, there's, there, was, there was rumor of the troubles on set. And again, I think when you have these shows, there's always rumors of the troubles on set. You have two young actors. They're in their early to mid-20s. They're doing this show. They both become stars, but one of them becomes kind of a superstar. Mm -hmm. And it's the second on the call sheet that becomes kind of like a superstar. So I think it it, it is sort of famous that there was rumor that there was trouble between the two stars on set. In a 1983 interview with Stephanie Zimbalist, um, when they were already shooting season two, here's what she said. She was troubled by how they were writing her character She's in season one. She said in some ep episodes, there's been a tendency to lapse into a traditional TV stereotype with the man calling the shots and the woman doing a lot of screaming. The only thing I'm troubled by is when they go away from the show's premise. I'm troubled when they forget that she's in charge. When they change the relationship, they change my character. That is why I took the show a strong lower halt. So I think it's interesting that she knew she was in a female driven TV show. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's interesting that that attitude, which seems like a pretty reasonable attitude for the star of a show is also the same attitude that caused trouble in some ways, potentially for Kate Jackson on Scarecrow Mrs. King. And by trouble, I'm doing that in quotes because I don't know how much trouble there was. They have since in later interviews, they, t they actually speak very fondly of each other and, and yet also acknowledge that they were both young and that they were both struggling with 
I think what that success of the show meant for them and the challenges. I think it's very challenging to be the lead actor on a show that has become very successful. I think it comes with a lot of pressure and there's a lot of people going, well, you have to, you know, make sure that you're in charge. <laughs> yeah. I'm, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, they're all, they're all human, they're human beings and they've, they've got all kinds of things coming at them in all different ways. And, you know, um, it's, it's, and even under the best of circumstances, people aren't always at their best for reasons that have nothing to do with whatever relationship working or otherwise you're ha you have with. We're all people, basically. We're all yeah. flawed people who have lives in and outside of, of whatever our work is that can sometimes infiltrate. I'm not saying it did, but, you know, you everybody brings things to work that, you know, don't necessarily... Um, belong there. And you, when you have to be that intimate with somebody else and yeah. you have to play in this way where you are intimate and you are being sort of vulnerable, I think it's very challenging. And they work long hours. They're on set 14, 16 hours a day. Doing their own stunts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> doing their own running, doing their own jumping um, and, and trying to remember what they're supposed to say at what time. I mean, it's not... It may look easy, but it's not. It's well, not for any I, of them. And so. I think Stephanie Zimbel has had a lot, a, a lot of say in in her character. I mean, I think they both did, mm -hmm. but I think particularly, you know. So this is one of my other little tidbits. Um, Laura Holt's famous fedora, which again is a pretty iconic from the '80s female-driven character image. Um, it was Stephanie Zimbel's idea. And according to Michael Gleason, she wanted to use it as a nod to The Thin Man and to 1930s comedies. She totally got that's what the show was was trying to do. It's one of the things that she loved about it was sort of the mystery and the comedy. Um, I think, you know, the writing w was pretty strong. So she really liked that. Um, but she really kind of picked that fedora for herself. The director, Robert Butler, loved it and ended up he was like, I, I ended up doing, using a lot of fedoras in that and that pilot and you can see it in the pilot <laughs> he put the four doors on the bad guys um that are kind of chasing pierce brosnan and then had to reshoot some of those scenes so that they because he's like there was too, there was too many hats <laughs> <laughs> and so you can see in one scene where they're uh the, the bad guys are sort of right next to pierce brosnan and, and flanking him and and talking to him they do not have fedoras on and then the scene immediately previous to and immediately following the following that scene they do <laughs> so they had reshot that scene in order to not have too many hats literally on scene on and, the screen and she looked great in a fedora not she all of great. us do i have to admit i'm i'm not a hat person my head and my hat doesn't doesn't like hats so i admire people who can wear a hat well i so. always wanted to wear a cowboy hat and i can't pull it off i i i, I could pull off a baseball cap for a while and so i still sometimes wear a baseball cap but i i I would love to. I have a fedora. I have a. It's still in my closet. It was my grandfather's fedora. Oh wow! But I can't wear it because I look like an idiot. Yeah, it does take a certain something to be able to pull it off, and she certainly could. So she certainly could. Yeah. And and they're a little nod to the costumes. Mm -hmm. Holy crap! They both look pretty great. Yep. In season one and, and throughout, it gets a little like, you know, there's definitely some '80s moments. There's just like a brown leather jacket <laughs> that you're like, hmm, I don't know about that. But uh, but his suits are pretty spectacular. Yeah. And uh, my directing uh, and acting teacher, Nina Fosh, who uh, taught at USC, um, talked about how well Pierce Brosnan worked a suit. Mm. He's like, he's one of the best actors for working suits and props. Um. And I went back and looked at those episodes at the time and, and watched that show to watch him work his suit. Um, he's always sort of pulling at the cuffs or, you know, he's he's always busy. Mm -hmm. He's he's very inventive as an actor in in the Remington Steel. If you're an, if you're an actor, an actress and you want to watch somebody kind of figuring out how and when to be busy that's a good character. That's a good actor to watch. And he does. He's not distracting with no. it. I mean, it's not pulling your your eye. It's just, yeah, it's it's really kind of amazing. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. She's so amazing in that, again, just she looks great in everything. Yeah. <laughs> She's pretty. She, she, they, they put her in some glamorous stuff and it's pretty 
it's pretty amazing. And stuff you're like, wow, that that, that necklace is something. But uh, but she pulls it off and um, and is also just very confident and mm-hmm. taking charge of so many scenes in those early episodes. It's really spectacular to watch even now. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm going to get to our last uh, little fact, factoid. Pierce Brosnan had never done comedy before. About midway through the first season, he apparently went to Michael Gleason and was like, how am I doing? I've never done comedy before. <laughs> and uh, and Michael Gleason was like, great, don't change a thing. I find that just so astonishing. He's so funny in the show, the things he does. And you can hear on at least one of the commentaries where they're talking about a little bit of business that he came up with. And he was constantly coming up with little things to to do to make the scene. I mean, he's he's just such a natural comedian. And I, I, I know that he was in Mrs. Doubtfire, but he was such a, um, straight man. Kind yeah. Of supporting that. character. I, I really wish he had, had had a chance to do something just real flat out comedy at some point. And, and if he has, I would love to, maybe I should go back and look through his IMDB page. Cause maybe I missed it. Cause I'm drawing a blank. And now, so. I, now I want to go, well, we're going to have to go back and see, I will say again, I think the comedy, the physical comedy gets a little dialed up in, in season two, three mm-hmm. and four. And he get, does get to do, he, he gets pretty quite wacky. So there's one of one of the episodes that I like, and I think it's in season four. And we'll go into this deeper later. Is is Louis Anderson is in, and he and Louis Anderson are basically doing, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a comedy duo team, detective team on their own. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's forgotten that he works with Laurel because <laughs> they're basically doing Abbott and Costello or something. Like there's a lot of like, wait, <laughs> they're having too good a time <laughs> anyway so those are all my little secrets most of them aren't secrets they can be found everywhere i thought it was um one of my other little fun uh things is that there's a special vanity card uh at the end for mtm mtm enterprises uh was created by mary tyler moore and her then husband grant tinker um to produce the mary tyler moore show not unlike lucille ball and desi right. arnaz creating right. desi Lou productions to do I Love Lucy, both Desilu and MTM Enterprises go on to produce, be the production company for kind of amazing yeah. amount of successful shows. Um, you know, sidebar, uh, Lucille Ball uh, ultimately bought out Desi Arnaz from Desilu and, and ran the company on her own. She was the first woman to run a major studio. Again, something that she doesn't get a lot of credit for. Uh, Desilu... Uh, produced 20 to 30 shows, including The Untouchables, Mannix, Mission Impossible, and Star Trek. A little show called Star Trek, <laughs> in addition to I Love Lucy. Um, but MTM Enterprises, created by Mary Tyler Moore and Grant Tinker, went on to produce Rhoda, Bob Newhart, The Newhart Show, Tony Randall Show, Lou Grant, White Shadow, WKRP in Cincinnati, Hill Street Blues, and Sane Elsewhere, which we were talking about earlier, mm-hmm. having just a spectacular cast. Anyway, I thought it was really interesting because the little vanity card at the end, they often changed for their shows. Their vanity card was basically a spoof of the MGM Leo the Lion logo. Um, and this was a little Mimsy, the orange tabby kitten, who is placed inside the MGM logo and adorably meowing instead of the lion roar for... Remington Steel, the logo had, the little Mimsy had a Sherlock Holmes cap and a pipe, and it drops out of the little cat's mouth when it meows. So cute. And it's pretty cute and very funny. It's a nice little button. (laughs) I was recognizing how cute that was. So that was my little shout out to Mimsy. All right. We're going to take a little break, and then we're going to come back and find out, but is it feminist? I think it's just, but is it? And then we'll find out if it's feminist (laughs) or more. Sounds like a plan. And we're back. All right. We're ready to do, but is it? Remington Steele, but is it feminist? Yes, it is. Sharon says yes. And why? You know, the first show we covered was Scarecrow and Mrs. King, about a a woman who had spent a number of years raising her family and got divorced and 
inadvertently found herself becoming a spy. This show is about a woman who decided she had a profession she wanted to follow, did all the work, and found that she wasn't able to be as successful as she would like without somebody thinking that there was a man who basically was in charge. But she did not let that stop her and made up Remington Steel, which allowed her agency to move forward. So as someone who believes that being a feminist basically is following your own path, whatever that may be in your professional or your personal life, this was her choice. She made it happen. So I think, yeah, it is definitely feminist. All right. All right. And what do you think? Well... I think it's um, both feminist and not feminist. Again, not unlike, no, no. And Melissa's going to, all right, Melissa, come on in because we know what she, we've been talking about. No, you got to get in here. Melissa Roth, get in here. Jump on in. I'll, I'll wrap it up later. Go. Blow back to the 70s. That's all I can say is that, you know, it's like, okay, we'll give her some time, but she can't really be on her own. It's got to be with the man, you know? Yeah. I, I. So for you, it is a no. I love them. I mean, you know, I was a big fan. I've been enjoying watching the reruns. They're adorable. Capital A, adorable. They work really well together, like you said. But I just don't see it as a feminist icon to hold up. There you go. All right. But here's what I'm going to say. She is a feminist. Yes. She is a feminist. Yes, sh- you did not cons- be that. <laughs> yes, no, I know. But here's the thing. If there is a strong feminist character in a show who is a lead of the show, the show could still be not feminist, but it still has an element of feminism. Agreed. However, this is big controversy, actually, and became so even before our podcast. Ooh, interesting. It in, seems so cut and dry to me. It seems, and, and that's what I'm saying, because <laughs> I think it, it does. The original concept of the show, I am going to say, is feminist. But the more interesting show that became of basically bringing in a man to become the fake man, the challenge is, and it, it, it really shows up in season one. It gets better in season two. Stephanie Zimbalist, I totally believe, is right. They changed the show. The concept, they're still thinking is a feminist show, but as soon as Pierce Brosnan shows up, and maybe because it's Pierce Brosnan, but mostly because... It's the man now actually being a real man in a position of power, even if he doesn't deserve it, even if he doesn't earn it. It's literally about she does all the work and he takes the bows. Quinted. It's, yeah. It's literally written into the saga cell of the show, which is I do all the work and he takes the bows. And that is one of the challenges of feminism is just being able to do all the work doesn't mean that. It's feminism. Well, I mean, you know, there are a lot of ways to define feminism. Yes. I find that the show is built more into the patriarchy than a feminist breakdown. You know, that it lines up with with gender roles that we're all familiar with. Yes. No question. But I think for me as a young woman, uh, when this show came out and seeing this woman on the show basically saying, I don't care that you. if these are the parameters in which I need to work in order to do what I want, because I'm really good at it and I really like it. OK. And then this guy comes along and he's taking all the credit, not particularly happy about it. But this is another way for me to expand my business and 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 I need to do this. Then that's what I'm going to do. It's somebody who's basically making choices for herself instead of just saying, Nah, all right, I'll go do something else. No, she's good at this. She knows she is. She shows she's good at this throughout the show. And he can't operate without her. Whatever, you know, whatever bows he's taking amongst the public between them, they know. They know that she's the one that's in charge. There's no question that she's the one that's doing. Yeah, she's doing all the work. And I think for me watching it at that age, it said it said it spoke to me. It said something to me about making a choice for myself in whatever endeavor it may be and to see a woman in charge. She's in charge. Absolutely. That was it was very inspiring. 
And and so and that is true. Mm-hmm. That um, in interviews, um, both Michael Gleason and Stephanie Zimbalist have talked about how many women have come forth to say how iconic, how important, and how vital it was to see Laura Holt's character that they, for the first time, saw somebody they could aspire to. It was a single woman making choices for herself. And again, if we look at Heart to Heart, if we look at Scarecrow Mrs. King, she's already identified with as being married or unmarried or divorced or in in the role of connection to a man. This is a woman that basically, because there's not a man in her life and she does not want a man in her life necessarily, she just basically puts up an interesting poster Mm -hmm. basically, and then continues to do the work. So it's, and that's why I think it's complex. That's why I will say it is both. It is both feminist and not feminist. And in fact, I'm not the only one that said that. So there's a, they talk about the fact that, that, that this journalist, and we're going to get into her in one of our other episodes, because she wrote famously about how much the show meant to her, and then felt bad about that, because she also was but I, I, I'm still not sure the show is feminism. Is it feminism or is it chauv- chauvinism? And the creators have talked about that. And here's why I will say it is not feminist. Because as lovely as they are, and from everything I hear, Michael Gleason, and Robert Butler, lovely people, fabulous men. Mm-hmm. But they weren't making a feminist show. And a feminist show doesn't need to be an issue show or whatever. It needs to be a female-driven show. Like Cagney and Lacey. Like Cagney and Lacey. Well, which we're, we're going to find out when we get there. I think on this, uh, it looks like a feminist show. I think it's a feminist show. We're going to find out. But what's funny is it's not clear in this exploration. Um, there are arguments both ways. This for them, they were like, I don't really know. Does this, you know, come down on either gender? Um, you know, they were like, it's just a clever old lady operating in a field not usually for women. And he's a lovable con man. And then there's a beat in this interview. And he says, when she's scheming, she's really cute, isn't she? And he he means it as a compliment. It is a compliment, but it is also demeaning. Well, there's no question, but that the people who made the shows behind the scenes may or may not have any intent to make a feminist show. I don't care about that. What I care about is what did they make and what reaction did I have to it? And... We've most we've only talked about the professional side of Laura Holt. But one of the other things about this show that I think made it very feminist is here she is a single woman. She makes no bones about the fact that she's not necessarily interested in getting married, never says anything about whether or not she wants to have kids, doesn't seem to be on a radar, certainly not at this point. As I said earlier, she and. Steele had several conversations about the nature of their relationship, and she was very clear about what she wanted and what she didn't want in a relationship with him because she didn't trust him or know exactly, you know, she didn't feel like she had enough information about him. You don't really get to see women basically standing up and saying, here's what I want. Here's what I don't want. Whether they intended it or not, that's what we got. That's what I got. And so I think you're right. What the artist intends isn't always what the audience is going to receive. And I do think that they were a little surprised about it. And you can hear it in the commentary. They literally, here's another quote from the commentary. We had no idea it was about identity. She created him. But as soon as he shows up, she disappears. It's so interesting. They suddenly found it interesting, this element of the show that felt built into the show for me as a person (laughs) in watching the show, that they're like, huh, it's kind of about identity, isn't it? And you're like, because they just, because it, because again, this was a time when you had to churn entertainment for television and you just had to come up with a great idea and run with it. And it was a lot about the mystery and it was a lot about the thing. So I give them credit for doing things they didn't even know they were doing. And I think that is casting. And I think it does come down to they cast the right person in that role to make sure to fight for that role Mm -hmm. and make sure it remains because it does, it starts to veer off in that first season. It's he is driving the bus. There's literally in in the pilot and it's really, really adorable moment in the pilot where literally 
they're chasing the bad guy and they jump on a little golf cart because those are everywhere apparently in the eighties <laughs> is little maintenance <laughs> golf carts. And, um, and he, he just gets into it first and she jumps on the back and then literally reaches over him to like drive the car with him. And that it's really adorable that, that, that basically she's from the back seat of this little, you know, golf cart driving the car. And that is what, to me, like the, the, what the show is about is she's still in the back seat and she's trying to drive the car and he's trying to drive the car. And so it's, it's a, it's sort of about both. The network was not making oh, a feminist show. Of course they weren't. Gleason also talks about how the network was always excited and looking for the quote unquote itchy scene. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what they were talking about until I realized they were talking about they wanted her to be sexually forward and sexually frustrated because she wanted to have sex with him, but she couldn't. That's what the network got excited about. And it does make you a little crazy because you're like, OK, just because feminism is not writing a sexually forward woman. That's what feminism was in the 80s. It in some ways still is. Mm -hmm. It's giving a in male ways. trait to it, a character. It, you're being very kind. <laughs> it was about. Her also being this cute little thing that, look, she's going to be a detective. She's plucky. Uh, <laughs> she's very plucky. And, you know, it may be because that I'm rewatching season three and four. I'm not see. I do not have season one and two. You started in the deep end. Yeah, I started um, in the deep end. And, and, and again, their relationship kind of takes over the show in a lot of ways. It's still case of the week. But what we care about is the relationship as an audience member. I think it's fun to watch the mysteries. And every once in a while you have one that's really great. But... It's it's just so interesting to hear the creators talk about their own show and recognize that maybe they didn't even know what they were creating. I have to say that doesn't surprise me in the least that they had no idea. Yeah, me neither. I, I <laughs> They just wanted to make a good show and it and whatever they needed to do or what direction they needed to go to make it good, that that was their that was their prime directive. Um and if it happened to turn out to be feminist, great. If it didn't, that's fine too. They just wanted to make what they thought was a good show, make the network happy, keep the trains running, so to speak. So it uh, does not surprise me in the least. Does and and again, at the end of the day, I don't care. And you don't care because <laughs> what it speaks to you is, yeah. is, is most important. And again, that Laura Holt character was an icon of feminism and still is and still speaks to people, particularly people that were growing up in the 80s women that were growing up in the 80s trying to figure out how do I want to be in the world? It gave another model for that. And it's an incredibly important character. Just like Mary Tyler Moore. Just like Mary Tyler mm -hmm. Moore. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's interesting. So by the numbers, should we do some numbers? Sure. All right. Because I like to look at the numbers because then we really know. So for five seasons, Remington Steel, out of 43 writers listed, how many female writers do we think there will be? Mm -hmm. Sharon? No, oh, not that many. Not that many. Melissa, you want to take a guess? I have no idea. Okay. I count nine female writers for the show. Robin Bernheim, who co-wrote an episode with Stephanie Zimbalist in season three, comes on to season four, actually, and, and is on the show. So she ends up writing more than anyone else on the show. Susan Baskin um, wrote on the show uh, more than one episode and talks about it, that was like her first big television writing job and has gone on. Both of them have had really incredible careers. Everybody else is one episode or, or maybe like two story buys. But again, this was still, this was the beginning of the transition from, I think, in this show they did have staff, mm -hmm. right? Robin Bernheim came on to the show as a writer but most of the episodes were created by freelance writers who would come in and pitch a show and they would inevitably for these shows be kind of the mystery writers and the detective writers. And again, very male driven show kinds of writing. <laughs> I didn't say that. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to speak so carefully now. <laughs> Out of 24 directors, on Scarecrow Mrs. King, we only had one female director, Miss Kate Jackson herself. She directed two episodes on Scarecrow Mrs. King. The rest of the directors were male. On Remington Steel, there were 24 directors listed, and there were three female directors listed. I'm going to give them a little nod for that, though there were no female producers listed. 
one of the directors is a renowned director who's gone on and directed all sorts of things. And Gabrielle Beaumont, she's British. And we were going to try to see if we can chase her down and get her on the show. We'll see. That'd I have no idea. It would be great because she, she, she looks amazing. There's one female editor out of the 11 editors, Susan B. Browdy. And there were three second unit directors that were women. Again, I think that's actually a pretty good ratio, mm-hmm. but I don't know because we haven't. I just started this little game that I'm going to play on all the shows we look at. I don't have any numbers, but for the time, I would say that that's probably pretty good, or at least good. Let's get let's call it a good. Let's call it a good. <laughs> Sharon, do you want to tell us about our special guests that we're going to have coming up on some of our next shows? I am beyond thrilled to say that we are going to be speaking with Robin Bernheim, who. Susan just mentioned was Stephanie Zimbalist's writing partner for an episode of season three and then came back on staff in season four. She and Stephanie are childhood friends, um, had known each other for a long time and came up with this idea for the script that they worked on between season two and season three, I believe it was. And that episode is actually one of my favorites. So, so looking forward to that. And as it happens, we are also going to be speaking with Stephanie Zimbalist herself. I'm so excited. Beyond excited. Beyond excited. I, I, it's, I'm speechless. I really am. (laughs) We're going to have to figure out how to speak when we, when we get to that. It's probably going to be a good thing that it's going to be over Zoom, that she's not going to be in the room because I don't know what I would do. I probably would just sit in the corner and just, you know, have a, crazy grin on my face looking like a sick like like a psycho so this is probably a good thing i am super excited you know if you had said to 1984 susan you would be talking with stephanie zimbalist in 2022 i would have been like what are you talking about i would have said the same thing if you told me that last year so there you go <laughs> i mean true that <laughs> that's absolutely true for me too <laughs> How do we get here? Just going to have to learn how to try to compose myself and try to come across as being a rational, reasonable human being. We're, we're going to pretend. We'll yes. just make it up. Exactly. We'll invent rational human beings <laughs> to to be in front of us, like Remington Steel. Exactly. I will become my own, have my own Remington Steel facade that looks and walks and talks like a rational human being while behind the scenes. I'm just losing it. So Well, and we have a lot to talk, to talk about Remington Steel. We're going to get into some of the other seasons. We're going to get into the guest stars in some of our next episodes. We're going to get into stunts and clothing. We're really excited for what's coming next. We're going to get into hats and hair. Stephanie Zimbalist and Pierce Brosnan's hair. <laughs> they both had some pretty beautiful hair going oh, on. Amazing hair. They're pretty beautiful. Oh, yeah. Well, just starts and ends there, doesn't it? Yes. But so, I, you know, tune in, stay tuned, send us your questions. Uh, and I think we got to head into our wrap up. It's time to wrap it up. We want to hear from you. What do you think of Remington Steel? Is it feminist? Is it chauvinistic? Is it both? Let us know on the website, 80stvladies.com and on social media at 80stvladies. We hope you will be joining us for the next episode where we will be interviewing writer-producer Robin Bernheim. We are so looking forward to it. Please send us your questions as we continue our dive into steel. Remington Steel. I like that. We hope 80s TV Ladies brings you joy and laughter and lots of fabulous new and old shows to watch. All of which we hope leads us forward to being amazing ladies of the 21st century. See you next time.